I'm John Robson, and this is the Climate Discussion Nexus Readout, Edition 9. We apologize for releasing it late. This is from the March 18th newsletter, but I'm in quarantine because of the virus. I don't think I have it, but we're not taking any chances, so that meant my videographer couldn't come over. And to be honest with you, my attempt at a home video wasn't entirely satisfactory. So we've decided just to release an audio version, and we ask you to bear with us while we work out a more satisfactory solution. Every Wednesday, we put out an email called the Wednesday Wake Up at CDN. It discusses the big climate news of the week, interesting opinion pieces, and developments in science. And then in these readout videos, I take a few topics from the newsletter and offer some quick extra commentary. If you want more in-depth information, please go to our website, that's climatediscussionnexus.com, subscribe to the Wednesday Wake Up, and also have a look at our videos. Our YouTube channel is ClimateDN. We've got lots of stuff there. The big news in the March 18th newsletter was obviously the coronavirus catastrophe, which, among other things, had caused the stock market to crash. And I know it's a painful subject. Everybody's worrying first about, of course, the health and safety of themselves and their loved ones, their friends and their colleagues. And then after that, what's happening to my savings? What's happening to my job? Where are we going to be when it's all over? It's a very upsetting situation, and we hope that everybody is staying safe and staying positive. We also hope that you're contrasting the scary developments in the stock market when COVID-19 became a pandemic with the impact of the climate crisis on the stock market. As you know, one of the long-standing demands of the Davos set has been that financial markets must take account of the world-ending extinction-level risks of climate change. And in response, the market spent the last decade soaring higher and higher. Obviously, no one could accuse investment managers of not having heard about the climate catastrophe since the great and the good have been yammering on about little else for years. And businesses have been making a fair bit of noise about it too. So, why didn't the endless hype about the enormous costs of climate change send stock markets into the tank? Could it be that businesses privately don't believe they're significant? But if that's the case, why do they keep saying otherwise? So in the March 18th newsletter, we talked about how shortly before the pandemic hit, Larry Fink, who's the CEO of the massive financial management firm called BlackRock, and also Elizabeth Warren, who was then a contender for the Democratic Party presidential nomination, wrote letters to senior executives, including bank executives, warning them about the need to take stock of the coming climate crisis and factor it into investment decisions. Now, this was a very strange request because the whole point of capital markets, the thing they do that has no equivalent in socialism or in government is that they bring future risks and opportunities into the present by sending share prices down or up depending whether a company looks as though it's going to experience good or bad things based on its investment decisions. Which, by the way, prompted us to ask as well, why do government mandarins like Mark Carney keep claiming that renewable energy is a brilliant investment and everybody else should put their money into it, but they don't seem to want to put their own lavish salaries into that kind of investment, just your shabby savings. Again, is it possible that they know hype real from real real? At any event, when the coronavirus hit, markets tumbled into a genuine financial crisis because it was something real with actual impacts bankers believed in. They saw the long-term costs and share prices dropped immediately. What are the long-term costs? Well, on a massive scale, people self-quarantined, either to avoid getting sick or to avoid making other people sick, which meant they stopped working, which meant they stopped creating wealth. This isn't something that causes a recession. This is a recession. And of course, the financial markets saw it clearly. And it's exactly unlike the rising seas, howling hurricanes, devastating forest fires, and all the other cliches that woke capitalists, among others, talk about as if they believed they were coming and worse to follow. But from their actions over the years, it's clear that people in business didn't really believe it, nor should they have. The big danger from climate change, what really might put the kibosh on sales and profits and jobs and their inescapable prerequisite, which is the creation of goods and services that make customers happy, is crazy green policies that destroy wealth to fight off purple dragons. So if you want to see share prices respond to truly catastrophic danger, add a green new deal to the COVID-19 crisis which of course is the exact opposite of what politicians are now doing because they're seeing what a real crisis looks like. Now, speaking of genuine danger, the March 18th newsletter also reported on a disturbing essay by a British university professor who invented the crime of postericide, which doesn't mean going around tearing down posters you consider ugly. It means destroying posterity by conspiring to bring about the extinction of humanity through climate change, which 
you may realize is what I'm apparently doing now. And if you're watching, you're risking an indictment as well. You see, by thinking critically about climate change and pushing back against unscientific alarmism and bad policy initiatives, we are now, it seems, to be ranked alongside history's worst genocidal maniacs. This author wants us to be brought up on postericide charges at an international court. For ourselves, we appeal to the court of public opinion. And the thing is, though, there's no shortage of nonsense on the internet. The reason we're focusing on this one is that it was published on the website of UNESCO, a major United Nations agency. Yes, it's the Many Voices One World outfit, which brags that its work is about, quote, building peace in the minds of men and women, end quote. Well, this doesn't seem like a very peaceful notion, does it? Nor does it sound like they're that interested in dissenting voices. Now, if that story depresses you, cheer up, because the March 18th newsletter also brought another installment of our 1919 or 2019 game. In this particular round of it, the idea was to look at lines showing temperature throughout the year from 1919 and 2019 for Winnipeg and to try to guess which is which. Since we're told there's been this big increase in temperature and also an increase in extreme weather, it should be obvious. One's higher than the other, and also it has these steeper peaks and valleys or long, weird plateaus. So go ahead, make your choice. The newsletter also reports on a new study that examined the claim that we've had cold winters lately. Not this year, but previous years, because global warming was making the jet stream wavier, with the result that it was pushing these polar vortexes south. And the study ended up showing the jet stream isn't getting wavier at all, let alone because of climate warming or whatever it's now called. As always, there's lots more on the Wednesday Wake Up. You can find it on the newsletter tab at climatediscussionnexus.com, and you can browse the entries and you can search through it for items of particular interest. Also, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and if you're finding our work worthwhile, go to our donation page and show us some love so we can keep the content coming. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson.